This week on the podcast, I have an extra special guest. Graham Weaver is founder and partner at Alpine Investors, a private equity firm focusing on software and services. Uh, Graham has a really interesting background, both engineering at Princeton and essentially launching a PE firm while he was a graduate student at Stanford. Everybody knows the story about Michael Dell launching a, a computer business out of his dorm room in Texas. This could be the first PE firm I'm familiar with that got started in a dorm room. What makes Graham so interesting is while everybody else in in the world of private equity is focused on the analytics and crunching numbers and creating uh, econometric models that will tell you where to invest, uh, I think they've found a very different model that has been extremely successful for them, where the key focus is on talent. How do we find the best talent, put them in place running our investment companies and allow them to generate the sort of returns uh, that you don't really generate by just looking at a model. I found our conversation absolutely fascinating, and I think you will also. With no further ado, my discussion with Alpine Investors, Graham Weaver. Let's jump right into this. Uh, Starting with your background, when I hear someone has an engineering degree, I tend to think of venture capital, not private equity. Tell us a little bit how you went the PE route instead of the VC route. Well, I actually started in private equity right out of undergrad. I really didn't know the difference between private equity or consulting or anything. I had zero knowledge of that. And I was fortunate to end up in Morgan Stanley's private equity group. I loved it. And I've kind of been in it ever since. Hmm. Really, really interesting. So is it from Princeton to Morgan Stanley uh, and then uh, Stanford, or am I getting the order? Yeah, right? I, went, I was at Princeton, then I went to Morgan Stanley and their private equity. Then I worked at a firm called American Securities for a couple of years and then went to went to business school uh, after that. And, and somewhere in the middle of this, there's a pig farm in Missouri <laughs> that I, I'm having a hard time figuring out what a pig farm has to do with, with private equity. So the very first deal I worked on. So I come out of school, I'm wearing my cross pen and my lapel and I'm like wearing a tie and all buttoned down. Exactly. And I I think I'm a big shot being on Wall Street and I get shipped out to this pig farm in Missouri, which was a deal Morgan Stanley had invested in. They'd invested a total of a billion, almost a billion dollars of debt and equity. And it Suffice to say, it was not going well. <laughs> so, uh, not that I was going to go save it as a 22 year old analyst, but I got shipped out. I lived in the CFO's basement for about five months, and uh, we did everything we could, uh, but it turned out not to not to be a great investment. So, but, so there's not big money in pigs. Well, it turns out hog prices are wildly cyclical, <laughs> and you know, there's the expression. How does a six foot man dra- drown in a river that averages five feet? You know, it's because there's parts of the river that are deeper. Well, you know, we build our whole model on hog prices being forty seven dollars, and when we within and that's what they average. Right? <laughs> that's what they average. But that doesn't tell you how much they swing up and down. It turns out, yeah, they were they went to eighteen dollars, and we had seven hundred million of debt, and uh, that didn't. $18. That, that didn't go well. So, that's yeah. the that's the old joke. It's not the price; it's the volatility that it, gets it, you. It was uh, yeah, it was rough, but it was a that was my introduction to the glamorous business of private equity. And you didn't turn around and say, "I want nothing to do." with I this. had the time of my life. Uh, really, it was so fun. Um, how learned... is that? How is sleeping in the CFO's basement? <laughs> what was his house on the pig farm? It was the, yeah, it was the whole entire town smelled like a pig farm uh-huh. and everyone, which is not especially delightful it's not no it turns out and every and pretty much everyone in the town worked and had some affiliation with the pig farm the cfo was also a morgan stanley guy and he was probably 27 so neither of us had so any years idea. years yeah, of experience yeah, exactly. over you neither of us had any clue what we were doing <laughs> and uh but but the it really wouldn't have mattered uh when your revenue gets cut by like 80 percent. there's just not a lot not a lot you're going to do to turn that around. <laughs> so, so there's a cliche about tech firms being started in dorm rooms. How does a private equity firm start in a dorm room? So I, I show up at Stanford and I'm in my first week of class. And then similar as today, you have to take these core classes your first year, which are just not that, you know, they're just fundamental. They're not, they're not that uh, exciting. So the first class I sit down and there's this 
this 25 year old who's never worked a day in his life. He's a PhD student. He's never taught before. And he's kind of just reciting out of this strategy book. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, what have I signed up for? So I, I had this idea that I was going to go try to buy a business. And I had, you know, in your first three years as an analyst, you basically build a financial model. But I had the confidence of someone. I thought I was much more, much better than I was. So I, I convinced a, an owner. I started cold calling companies in a sector that I had looked at pr- previously. And I uh, convinced this, this owner to sell me his business. And, and then I had to go raise the money, uh, most of which was debt and the little bit of equity that was needed, I financed with credit cards. Right. <laughs> so that was literally how I started, not your typical private equity founding story. <laughs> how did that initial PE transaction work out? I did a total of uh, three label deals with some add-ons, lost money on one, uh, made money on one, or made, you know, lost a little bit of money on one, lost, made a little bit of money on the second one. And then the third one, third one was a total home run, which I actually just sold uh, this year, uh, 20, 20 years later. So that, that one turned out well. 20 years. That's impressive. That's not the typical private equity holding period. Yeah. Well, it it was just me. I was the, (laughs) it was just my, so you could afford to be patient. (laughs) And it was, it it was awesome. It was a great, uh, that one. What, what, what space was that in? It was the, the, we had these companies that made these little labels that went on, uh, products like for example, in Trader Joe's, uh, Trader Joe's private labels things. We made all those labels. It, it's a totally unsexy business, right? But it was very consistent it, and, and it's profitable. It was really profitable, and no one wakes up and says, "You know, I'm going to be a hero because I'm going to save a half a cent on my label." So it tends <laughs> to kind of like just clip along like a bond, right? So it, it turned out it turned out well, but I mean, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, and uh, huh. and so I made I made every mistake you can imagine, <laughs> and it still worked out. When you launched in 2001, you started with 50, 55 million dollars, something like yeah. that, and now it's up to eight billion across yeah. eight funds, and your most recent fund just closed about two billion dollars, more or less. Yeah, about two and a two point four. Yeah. All right, so that that's real money, two point four. <laughs> Obviously, you're doing something right. The track record has to be attractive. Is it the same investors rolling over or or new and different investors? Who is the clientele for this? In the very early days, it was a number of individuals because no institution was going right. to back a 20 Well, you have to have yeah. a certain track record, be yeah. around for a certain length of period, be able to check all of their due diligence boxes, and that takes yeah. time and, I and checked, money. And I checked zero right. of those boxes. Right. So, Dorm room, check. What yeah. else? What else we got? Yeah, track How record. old is he? 22? No. Sure. Let's you know, write him a big check. Exactly. I checked no boxes. And that took me like almost a year to figure out. I went to all these institutions, and I never got past the first meeting anywhere. And then I found a, a number, a two, really two individuals who, thank God, they're, I still owe everything to these these two Um one, I don't know if I can. can sure, say you can say whatever you so, like. So, um, one was Tom Steyer, who ran for president. Um, oh, he, sure. He was one of the early ones, and then uh, Doug Martin from the Stevens family, and they were just the two best investors you could ever have, and um, they they were supportive, and most importantly, they were supportive after Fund One, which was not a good fund. So. That's the reason we're still in business. Why today. not a good fund? Just performance wise, or was it because when you launch in one, we're still in the early days of a massive downfall in technology, media, internet, straight across the board. Not you know, it's not if, unless it's a distress fund. That's not the ideal time to launch. Yeah, I, I would love to say that it was the market, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was self inflicted. Yeah, it was me making a lot of dumb mistakes. Uh, being overconfident, you know, and and just investing in companies that looked great in a spreadsheet and didn't. What looks great in a spreadsheet is low purchase price and a lot of leverage. Mm-hmm. That looks always looks good in a spreadsheet, but the, the quali- leverage is the problem. The qualitative, yeah, the leverage is the problem, and the qualitative things about is it a quality business? Those things you can't model in a spreadsheet. And so I just made a lot of dumb mistakes, and we actually the whole fund overall lost money. I would highly, Barry, not recommend having your first fund when you launch lose money. It was a probably not the best it was long-term anchor, strategy. Yeah, it was an anchor around our neck for pretty much a decade. So that um, raises the question: If the first fund was a bit of a stiff, 
how did you raise money for the second fund? Well, thankfully, we were. Re- I, I really communicated a lot with Doug and Tom, and they understood. They could see us getting better. You know, they, uh, they could see us making a lot of improvements, fixing a lot of the things that we uh, got wrong. And both both of them were pretty seasoned investors. Both of them had had mistakes they'd made before, and so they, you know, thank God, were really supportive. And then. And then it wasn't like immediately we started knocking out of the park either, but we started getting better and better. And um, and and then and then really around the time of the recession was when we really completely transformed and became kind of the the business that we are today. And, and it's a little bit of a cliche. They're not so much investing in a fund as they're investing in you as the manager. Obviously, they saw something that was, hey, needs a little seasoning, but there's a lot of potential here. Yeah, they saw someone who was willing to literally run through walls and run through a burning building to make it work and and I I almost literally did <laughs> I mean it was it was that um we were we and not just me but our whole team was was really committed to trying to trying to make it work and I think they saw that huh, quite quite interesting I have to talk a little bit about your growth rate you, you began with 54 million dollars all in your your 8 billion in assets totally Obviously, a lot of that is not just growth, but uh, new investors coming along. But still, that's a as a as a PE company. Alpine has really seen quite a corporate growth trajectory. Tell us what led to this uh, success rate. Yeah. So when when the recession hit, we were uh, in we were not well positioned. We didn't. Now, when you say recession, yeah. Because some of our audience <laughs> is, yeah. you know, older than twenty five. I'm assuming you mean 08, 09, the 08, financial 09. crisis. Okay, yes, yeah, so. not the one in twenty twenty, right. and not the one that maybe happens sometime in twenty twenty two, and certainly not two thousand. That's right. So the great financial crisis. So great financial crisis happens. We were we invested the last dollar from our third fund two weeks before blew, uh, two weeks before Lehman Brothers blew up. Wow. And so we were out of money. And we had it took us forever to raise the next fund, but that period where we didn't have any money turned out to be the most important period for us. Why? Because we started deciding we were going to look at our own business. You know, kind of like rather than working in the business, we we're going to start working on our business. Uh huh. So I hired an executive coach. Um, oh, really. And he helped. He he really helped me kind of redefine the business that I truly was in, which I'll come back to. We hired a consulting and coaching firm for our whole organization. And so we really started doing some soul searching for lack of a better word. And then, and, and from that, we really, you know, changed our strategy and developed kind of a new playbook. Um, so let me interrupt you there because yeah. that you raised something that I'm fascinated by. So first, what leads you to say, we need a pro to come in and show us how to do this? And second, how do you even go about finding an executive coach? That sounds like, man, the, uh, that's a consulting field fraught with, you know, <laughs> let's be polite and just say high risks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And I am a huge fan of executive coaching. Uh, I have had a coach since 2009. I've wow. talked to a coach every week or every other week since 09. No kidding. And we at Alpine have 23 coaches that are part of our, um, they're, they're 1099 folks, but they're part of our ecosystem that's available to our people at Alpine and our executives. So I'm, I'm just a huge fan of coaching. And basically what I love about coaching is you, you create space away from the busyness of the day to day. And you ask yourself a bunch of really important questions. You know, what do I want? What's success look like? What do I want in, you know, what's a five-year plan look like? And you actually have to really burn some energy and some thinking time thinking about um, those, those answers, which are really hard answers, uh, which most of us never spend time thinking about. What, was it just in the midst of the, the crash and, and recession that you said, hey, maybe we just need a little help? We're not, we, we don't have the professional background to run the business. We know the investing side, but the business side is something very different. How, how yeah, do you get to that? Hundred percent. I mean, I think one of the benefits of face planning in your first fund <laughs> yeah. is that you get some humility, right? And you, I've always just you know been open to learning from people that are smarter and better than I am. And so, coaching was an exercise back then in two thousand nine. It was not very well known, and it was definitely an exercise in humility of saying, "I think I need some help." That that's the old joke. Experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. 
right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so once you make the decision, hey, we want to bring in a professional to show us uh, ways to improve our business methods, how does one go about finding a, a, a business coach? So I had an introduction from a friend, and then we had a number of lunches, and his business wasn't going well in 09 either, <laughs> as you could imagine. Well, who's, so, who's yeah. on, other, on, other than people doing distressed <laughs> debt investing, whose business was going great in 08? Yeah, exactly. Nobody. Them so, and short sellers. Everybody else was in trouble. So we had this awesome conversation. I can still, it's one of these conversations you can still remember where you are and what you, you know, exactly the moment. So mm -hmm. we have, this is actually after I, I brought him on. We have this awesome conversation where, where I said, hey, I have to, his name's JP Flom. And I said, hey, I have to cancel our, our coaching engagement. I'm just too busy, which was like, we'd already decided ahead of time that there was, that was no go. I had to stick with it. Like right. we made that agreement. So he, he texts back immediately says, no, we're having it. So I, I get on the phone. He says, well, what's, you know, what's so crazy that you're so stressed? I said, oh my God, JP, you know, I got to fly to Dallas and fix this. And then I got to, you know, we, we got a deal we're about to lose. And then we lost a huge customer in Chicago. Then I got to go to DC and then, you know, I'm going on and on. And he said, okay, well, let's, let's kind of slow down and chill out. Let's talk about Dallas. What's going on there? Well, we you know, we just missed our bank projections a second time and I'm, I'm going on and on. And he starts saying, well, tell me about the CEO in Dallas. And I'm like, well, what does that have to do with anything? You know, we're in the middle of the great recession. Like, blah, 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 blah. you know, it's not, it's, you know, it's a market, so whatever. Anyway, he, it, get, it comes to the point he says, well, eventually he says, well, how would you, how would you rate that, that CEO, you know, A, B, C? And I was like, I don't know, you know, probably a B. He said, "Well, Graham, at the at one of our engagements, you said you wanted to build the greatest private equity firm of all time. Are you gonna Are you gonna do that with a B CEO?" <laughs> and I just it like hit me between the eyes. And then he asked me another question. He said, "And Graham, if you're someone who keeps a B CEO, what does that make you, you? How would you rate yourself as right. a CEO?" And I just I like it stopped me dead in my tracks. And that was really this light bulb that went off that ended up having us having me realize. I'm actually in the talent business. That's the fundamental business that I'm really in. And that was like 09 that we came to that realization and then started completely redesigning our, our firm to like build our companies around talent, build our firm around talent, build our investment strategy around talent. So that that was just a huge turning point. So, so let's talk about that because all of your investments eventually get a CEO that's been trained at Alpine and uh, has the benefit of all of this coaching, all of this training, all of this expertise. It's not that you're just looking for attractive balance sheets. It's where can we put someone in charge to move the needle by taking our expertise and applying it to this business model? I is that what you mean by when you say you're in the talent business. Yeah, I think that's what I mean. There's two parts of it. One is our investment strategy, which is what you described. The other is how we run our own firm. But sticking with what you were talking about, Barry, the investment strategy, we found that the single most important investment decision we make is the management team. And it's more important than the price we pay. It's more important than the leverage levels. It's more important than the prior growth rate. And so we just said, well, if that's really the most correlated, most effective or most important criteria, you know, let's make sure we get that right. And so let's actually kind of build our own CEOs and 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 put our own CEOs in so that we can make sure that we're getting a an, you know world class person to run each one of our companies. So so in some ways this is almost parallel in the public markets to activist investing where they identify a very attractive business that isn't quite living up to potential. Right, yeah. and they say, "Hey, with a few management changes, we can turn this into a really good business." On the private equity side, uh, I'm assuming the conversation is something like, "We want to either buy 30, 40 percent of your business or your entire business, but regardless, we want one of our professionals to come in and manage it." Yeah, that's right. A lot of the companies we're buying don't have management. You know, it might be a corporate carve out, it uh -huh. might be a management team that wants to retire or exit, and. And that's great. So there's never any conflict. We're totally transparent. We're not doing hostile deals, nothing like that. It's always the transaction that the seller wants to do is they want to retire. So it's always very friendly. But we there aren't a lot of private equity firms that want to go through the process of changing management because mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to do. And that's the value add that you guys bring. That's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah that, that's really quite fascinating. So there's a quote of yours I, I have to lead with, which I find really intriguing. Quote, People create returns, not deals, not price. That's a that's a huge 
statement considering most of the analyst community, especially private equity, is so analytical and modern driven. You're saying this is a people business. Yeah, 100 percent, Barry. Um, I think that if you want to do something different than people, you have to have some fundamental belief that's different than what other people believe. And our belief is that returns come from from people. They come from talent. And 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 I think maybe one of the reasons why people shy away from that is it's hard to analyze. It doesn't fit in a spreadsheet and it's incredibly hard to manage. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot easier to manage the uh, the hard numbers, the the financial statements and things than it is to you know, really manage a, a team of people. So we were talking earlier that you appoint a CEO at these these purchase businesses that you've trained um, yourself. Tell us a little bit about what that in-house training looks like. So a lot of the CEOs we're hiring, we're bringing right out of uh, MBA programs and they have five years of experience typically before they go into business school. And that could be anything. That could be that they were in the military, they could have been in consulting firm, they could have been investment banking. And we have success with any of those back, any and all of those backgrounds. So, and they've just been in two years of business school, so we don't wanna put them back in business school. But what we're really teaching them, the, the fundamental thing we're teaching them is how to hire, how to build their team, how to set a vision, how to create priorities, how to get everyone in their organization excited and aligned behind what they're trying to do. Those are things that uh, not a lot of business schools um, teach. It's one of the things I try to teach in my class, but it's something that we bring in. It's the biggest thing we bring in that in that training program that we do. Hiring has been described as the most difficult aspect of building a company versus everything else. 100%. How, how do you teach good hiring? You can actually, to some extent, make hiring a science. Um, and the the simple, I could talk for you, I could talk for three hours about this, but I'll try to do it in about two minutes, which is you build a scorecard for what you want that role in that role, a specific list of outcomes you want that role to do. And then as you're assessing a candidate, you're looking for very specific evidence that they're going to be able to perform against that scorecard. And you have two things you're looking for, attributes and experience. Those are the two different parts of the interview process. Well, we all know what experience is. Define what attributes means. So attributes is about who somebody is versus what they've done. So an example for us, when we're hiring young people to become CEOs, we're looking at, you know, do they have a will to win? Do they have uh, emotional intelligence and self-awareness that they can get along with people? Mm -hmm. And then do they have grit? Can they, are they going to be able to see things through after getting kicked in the teeth? Because <laughs> right. they're going to get kicked in the teeth. So those are the three attributes that we're looking for. Those are wildly more important than experience because huh. they'll get experience quickly and you can teach experience. You can't teach those three things. You can't teach you know, the will to win. Um, they, they're kind of coming to us with that or they're not. That's an, that's an intrinsic aspect of the personality. You either have it or you don't. There's no way you're going to learn that. Not in a, a period of time. <laughs> or, or we don't know how to teach it if it is right. huh. Yeah. Really, really interesting. So so you mentioned your class. Let, let's talk about the management course that seems to be related to that, CEOs in training. T tell us about that. Yeah. So the CEO in training, is the, the that's the name for the people that we're hiring. Did you want to talk about that or the class itself? Either Both. Either okay. or. All right. So um, CEO in training is the name we give to those people we're hiring right out of business school. We're giving them that experience uh, training that I mentioned, and then we're putting them right in. Um, a lot of them are CEOs on day one of add-on acquisitions, and they get the reins, and they're you know they're off to the races. Um, and and you know there aren't a lot of positions out of business school that you can become a CEO within you know right when you graduate. So we're uh, we've designed that, and it's been it's been a home run. We I underestimated how amazing these students would do in the roles that they've done, and uh, and it's 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 been fantastic. Do, do you end up hiring people right out of uh, your classes, or? Yeah, I mean, I. So this I don't, is really a devious <laughs> recruitment tool. I don't interview anybody from Stanford. Period. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if they applied. I keep a wall between, right? You know, my teaching and um, and and recruiting. But I will say, probably teaching there has helped the Alpine brand. Sure. Uh, and and help me, un and more importantly, help me understand what students are capable of, which is a lot, and what they want, which is 
they want to be the boss right away. And I think so it's helped, it's helped me learn a little bit more about how to build a program that the students want to actually do. So one of the things the CIT program does is to try and increase underrepresented individuals in PE. Tell us a little bit about what diversity does for your business. Yeah, well, it is, it's, it's awesome what we can do. If you, the great thing about hiring for attributes over experience is that we can actually have a huge impact on diversity. So for example, if I said, we're hiring a CEO to run a healthcare software business, and our criteria is they have to have done it for 20 years. Right. Then I'm that that battle has been won or lost 20 years ago. Right. And yeah, I could hire someone who's a diverse candidate from one of my competitors, but I haven't really created any value. If I hire someone right out of business school, let's just use women as an example, and 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 a, and that woman wouldn't have necessarily seen a path to become a CEO, and I can provide her a clear path then I can actually increase the number of women that become CEOs, which is exactly what we've done. We have over 50% of our CEOs in training that we've hired uh, have been women, about 30 to 35% have been underrepresented minorities. And so we have, we can have a, we can really move the dial on creating more, you know, diversity in the CEO ranks. Hmm. That, that's really kind of interesting. Uh, let's talk a little bit about software and services. Why focus on those areas in particular? So one of the things that we figured out, which probably took us way too long to figure out, is if you if you buy recurring revenue, there's just a lot fewer things that go wrong. So mm-hmm. we're we're not unique in focusing on um, recurring revenue, but that we we turned the dial in, in, in around that Great Recession time and decided that was all we were going to do. And it'll so it, look- it's less focused on winning that one big sale, and it's more about building a business that has a fairly steady revenue stream. That's right. And then if you marry that with what I was saying before about putting young people to run them, recurring revenue is really helpful because in the first year they have a big learning curve and you right. you know they they we need them to have a little bit of a cushion for them to get up to speed. So recurring revenue helps a ton because it does take them a little while to learn huh, how to be a that, CEO. That's really interesting. Uh, software obviously has been really hot over the past couple of years. Any chance that that changes or slows down, or is software just the driver of the future? I mean, I think software is the driver of the future, and I think anything, even the driver of the future, can get overpriced. Sure. And you can overpay for any asset. And I think in the last few years, you know, people have have gotten a little ahead of themselves with some of the multiples that were were paid, but I don't think that changes fundamentally. That I think software's, you know, software's here for a long time, and it's and it's got a lot of really exciting trends. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to have you put this back earlier in the hiring discussion because I missed something, and I want to come back to it. You've discussed episodic versus programmatic hiring. I- explain the difference between the two. Yeah, great question. So. I might have made up those two terms, but... <laughs> well, that's why it jumped yeah, out at me. I'm yeah. like, I don't know what either of those things yeah. are. I have to ask that I think question. I, I think I did make them up. But um, so episodic hiring is what everyone does. Okay, we need to see... We have it. an opening. Yeah. Fill this... Uh, go to LinkedIn. Exactly. Put out an ad. Get me somebody here. Exactly. Or, or yeah, we'll hire Russell Reynolds to get us a CFO or whatever. That's, that's how everyone hires. Um, that is two problems. Well, a number of problems. One is it's slow. Uh, and two is it's expensive. And three is it actually doesn't even work that well. Like uh-huh. the higher, the hit rate is pretty low. The hit rate across the board in hiring statistically is about 50%, but that's measured as are they still there in three years? Not did they, were they successful? So I'm, it's even worse than that. So, so that's a problem with episodic hiring. So programmatic hiring is you're going to hire the same role a lot. And so how do you make that more of a program? So for example, you know, we're hiring... 17 people from business schools that start next month, or we're hiring 27 uh, undergrads to be interns who will matriculate into full-time roles. And and so there's a group of people that are graduating. You can kind of have a class of folks. You can give them way more training. You can build a whole program using the, pro, you know, to mm-hmm. use the programmatic term around that. And it's just a lot more effective. That's two roles that we do at Alpine, the CEOs in training and, the, and then the analysts. But then in our companies, you know, in some cases that's engineers, technicians, uh, where that's their recurring hire that they're doing, and we're helping them build programs to to start with people who don't know how to do those functions 
and bring them up, you know, through training to 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 learn those. Huh. Really, really quite interesting. And you can scale. You can just scale a lot better, and you have a way higher hit rate. Doing so, that. so you're constantly maintaining a pool of either potential hires or actual employees that you're waiting to promote. Absolutely, yeah. Before we get into the current market environment for private equity, I have to circle back to you teaching at Stanford uh, at the graduate school. Tell us a little bit about the courses you teach and, and what students learn. So I, I teach two courses there. I teach, uh, they're both they're both basically similar. One is for first years and one is for second years, but they're both centered around entrepreneurship. And the idea of the courses is that there's lots of classes on analysis and accounting and finance, and there aren't a lot of classes around how to actually manage people, lead people. And I'm talking the nitty gritty stuff of literally like what to say if you have to fire someone. Mm -hmm. My students have to roll, my students will say, oh, I would just fire that person. I say, okay, great, I'll be them. Right, and you fire go, me. Fire me. And then they have to do it and they it's realize harder than it looks. it's a lot harder than it looks. Or that, they'll say- That's why people <laughs> just cheat and send emails, which is always so mortifying. Yeah, that would not be uh, something we teach. <laughs> we do not we do not teach people to send so, an email. So tell us about the role playing. What is that so, like? So, we, so the student will actually play uh, the protagonist in the case and I'll play the antagonist, for lack of a better word, of the other characters. And then they'll fire me or they'll have to demote me or they'll have to tell me that they no longer want to be my partner or whatever the situation is that they're trying to get through. And then we'll play around with it and they'll realize, you know, some things they do right, some things they do poorly. And then the entrepreneur uh, about whom we've written the case is in the class. And so then they'll chime in and say, well, wow, this is you did this this way. This is why I didn't do that. Or I wish I would have done it that way. Instead, I did this. Um, so it's a really it's a really, really fun class. It's uh, and, and it's something that they don't get anywhere else where they actually have to kind of implement the stuff they're talking about. So aside from firing, what else do you teach so them? Everything. We, we actually teach a lot on hiring. Um, we have a whole uh, modules and playbooks and videos and things I've made. And we do a, cl a class on that, which is really important. Uh, we, we talk about uh, complex partnership issues, uh, things with your board. Uh, they have to sell stuff. They have to fundraise. Um, uh, how to how to make an offense and defense deck to sell to sell something and you know a whole list of th basically things that entrepreneurs are going to have to face in their life. Huh. Re really intriguing. I, I have to imagine having been a, a a graduate student at Stanford, it's deeply satisfying teaching there. It's a blast. Um, I started off as a case guest where they wrote a case about me buying stuff in my dorm room, <laughs> and I was a case guest. And I kept I would come home all energized. And it was my favorite day of the year. And then when the uh, Irv Grosbeck, who wrote the case about me, who's a legend at Stanford, when he he called me one day and said, "Hey, you know, I'm going to stop teaching this class. Would you want to teach it?" And I, and my first response was, um, "No, I have a job, you know, and I can't." But I didn't say that. I said, "Hey, I'll think about it." And then thankfully, everyone I was around was like, "Graham, you have to do this, and it's your favorite thing you do." And and we we figured out a way to make it work. So it's it's a blast. That that sounds but like that sounds like it's a lot of fun. One more thing I would just add is um, what I realized after a few years is I'll teach students all about entrepreneurship and we have this great class, and then they go take a job, you know, in consulting or in, you know investment banking. And they never become entrepreneurs, uh -huh. even though that was what they wrote their essay about and that was what they were excited about. So I added to the class a whole part on, okay, wait a second, what is it you really want to do with your life? You know, what's holding you back? How would you make a plan to go do that? What are your limiting beliefs? What are the things, what are your fears? So we have a whole thread, probably 25% of the class is on those things because I'm like, I, what's the point of teaching people to be entrepreneurs if they don't become entrepreneurs? Right. So so I've, I've invested a lot into like personal growth and uh, and that's a really, really fun part of well, the class too. Well, are any of those skill sets transferable to consultants who are oh, 100%, 100%. they'll be working with other entrepreneurs yeah. and maybe haven't been exposed to Yeah, 100%. Before? It wasn't so much that I have anything against consulting. It was just that the student at the beginning of the class said, my goal is to do X, and then they don't do X. That was all. So tell us a little bit about your approach. What's your process sure. like to finding a potential acquisition target and since we look at both private and public markets, what do you think of in terms of valuation? How do you yeah. come up with a number? Yeah, great questions. We we have uh, a large team that that looks for potential companies. We have actually fifty two people at Alpine and in the in our portfolio companies that are looking for deals. 
Um, 52. So, 52. Oh, so that's a lot of people. Yeah. How, how big is the firm overall? Overall, if you include the CEOs and training and um, we have- And your 1099 <laughs> consultants. We probably have roughly 200. All right, so that's a, yeah. that's a decent size. The company. 52 also includes a number of people that are working at the companies doing sourcing, but they're doing the same thing. They're calling companies looking for investments. Mm -hmm. So we have 52 people looking for deals. And then a lot of those conversations are directly with founders. And what we're trying to do is figure out, the way we think about it is, we can pay a price that we can hit our target returns, which I can't talk about on, you know. Right. But you, we can hit we our target. We all have compliance departments. <laughs> so we, we, we can pay a price that we can hit our target returns with like a 70% base case. And then we need there to be a lot more upside to that mm -hmm. than downside. So we want there to be like a case where we could hit many multiples of our target returns. And so based on that, we kind of back into a price. And then where we get in trouble or, or where things get turned down at investment committee mm -hmm. is when everything in the world has to go perfectly right. to hit that target. Because I've, I've been in this business for 28 years. And when you start pricing in perfection, that's a time when you realize you're overpaying. Right. Uh, so that that's that's it's that seventy percent probability and lots of margin of safety thing that you real as someone who's like a little bit more senior at our firm, I have to bring that to the to the discussions. Yeah, the, that perfect <laughs> ten stuck the landing. Those are the outliers. You certainly can't rely on. Exactly. That. You can't underwrite to that for sure. Yeah. So when you look at this macro environment, it seems to be pretty supportive of economic expansion generally. How closely do you pay attention to things like, hey, the Fed is raising rates pretty rapidly. Maybe they're going to cause a recession next year. We pay um, attention to it to some extent. If you go back to the 08 crisis. Now that's a recession. Yeah. Right? And we're, we're just in a very different position. Um, I think we are way underbuilt on housing. So, you know, I don't wildly. see- Wildly. Wildly underbuilt on housing. So I don't see, you know, I, I don't see things happen, you know, crashing there. I think- we have the consumer isn't as leveraged as they were back in 2008. Businesses aren't as leveraged as they were. I, I just think it's a lot healthier. On the flip side, we also don't have the Fed can't print money like they did in 08 because of inflation. But I think generally it just feels like we're a lot healthier than we were back then. Right, you're, you're singing my song. I'm in the exact same place. I'm, I'm kind of perplexed by all the recession chatter. I mean, what are we, two, seven, two, eight million new jobs in this year? That's not what you usually see. Although, to be fair, some past recessions, we were creating jobs right until the moment it stopped and, and the bottom dropped out. But, you know, it really depends on uh, how aggressive the powers that be are going to get about inflation. So here's the question related to that and 0809. Let's say the naysayers are, are right and the end of this year or 2023 – we see something more than just a mild shallow recession. We see a real recession. How does that affect the companies you look at? And do you start doing, for lack of a better phrase, distressed private equity investing? You know, I think that what we've been trying to do over the last 14 years is underwrite companies that would do well in a recession. Um, so hopefully we're going to, our companies will hold up well in that time. In terms of what we look for, it does open up the door when you know when there is a recession. There's a lot more different things that are for sale at different prices, and and I think one of the great assets is if you have a whole team of managers that you can put in to run distressed things. You have a lot of options open to what you can look at. So there, you know, there will be a lot more interesting things to to do with you know if that happens. Certainly, don't wish that on the on the economy on anybody else. And then finally, I have to ask about. The way you score software companies and services companies, you use a metric I really am not familiar with, ENPS. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I think in general that there are leading indicators and lagging indicators. Lagging indicator is revenue, EBITDA. Those are lagging indicators. But yet a lot of managers, they try to manage to lagging indicators. It's like, and, that, and that's just not very effective. So what we've tried to do is develop what are the leading indicators that are going to predict success. And the number one most important leading indicator, you're not going to be surprised to hear me say, is talent. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me I'm on the board of your business and and we're starting to build the world-class management team, I can tell you in two years, we'll have a home run investment. So one of those leading, two of those leading indicators related to talent are 
employee net promoter score, which is the NPS. You know, Meaning how employees rate their employees. Exactly. Yeah. Would mm-hmm. would they would they recommend this company to a friend? Um, and we we measure that every quarter for every one of our companies. We measure it at Alpine. We wow. measure it for a whole bunch of different groups within Alpine. And then retention is the other big one. So if we can be managing those and getting those right, those are leading indicators that are going to help us set up you know, the, the revenue EBITDA to come later. And those are hard things to manage. Getting those those metrics right takes a lot of work. That's actually where I spend most of my time at Alpine, hmm. believe it or not, is making sure that we're creating an environment where the best people want to be and stay. And most people, again, in the finance world, they don't think about kind of squishy, soft metrics like that. But they should be. <laughs> well, because they have a really outsized impact on the performance of a company. Absolutely, I, I, that, that's my view. Is they have they, they they have the biggest impact. And my last question before I get to our favorite questions, we ask all our guests. It's a little bit of a curveball. You were captain on a national championship rowing team in college. I was, yeah. Tell us about that. So you, I, you look <laughs> like you rowed. Row. <laughs> so I. Uh, I came to college not even knowing anything about rowing. I didn't even know that the boats went backwards right. until I got in a boat. Well, it's not that they're going backwards. It's just that you're facing right. backwards. Exactly. Yeah, I didn't even know that. Um, <laughs> so I I started as a novice. I walk on the team, and I'll, uh, it seemed like everyone else on the team had rowed before. Uh, so I was horrible, absolutely horrible. I got cut and then just kept kind of – and and so there's this – funny story where the coach says, okay, these are the people who go into boats. The rest of you are quote land warriors <laughs> and your land warrior means you go on the rowing machines. And so the, that night when he kind of posted the boats and I wasn't in the boat, he said, all right. You know, so I did this calculus and I'm like, okay, well, gosh, all the land warriors are going to show up before class, you know, classes, first class is at nine. So they're going to show up at eight, but so I got to show up at seven. No, no, no. And everyone's going to think that. So I'll show up at six. <laughs> so I show up the next morning, zero people. And one of the guys is like, Hey, idiot land warrior is another way to say you got cut, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I still stayed as a land warrior and kept getting better at getting my erg times better and better over time. And it was one of the greatest things I ever did. I, I, uh, I had a, I had a great time. And, and when um, were they national champions? My senior year, uh, I was... So by then, you're on the team. By my, the, yeah, by my senior year, I was pulling one of the best erg times in the nation. And, erg uh, time? Rowing machine. On the Concept 2 rowing machine like you see in the gym, mm-hmm. they actually have a standard test, which is 2,000 meters, that which you submit you know, nationally. And my, by my senior year, I had one of, and maybe a few times, the number one erg time in the country. And, um, and I was elected captain by my uh, teammates of our team. And then that year... We were supposed to have a rebuilding year mm-hmm. because we lost all these seniors and we actually won the whole thing. That's amazing. So it was awesome. Wow, that's really amazing. Let's jump to our favorite questions that we ask all of our guests, starting with what kept you entertained during the pandemic lockdown? Tell us what you were uh, streaming. Um, I went on this whole Buddhist thing <laughs> during the pandemic and I started reading a lot about Buddhism and streaming Buddhism and it was it was amazing meditating or meditating and just kind of learning about buddhism and you know why we all suffer and how to you know how all these thoughts we have in our head are our own imagination and i went on this whole kick during the pandemic which was phenomenal i highly recommend it huh. uh, and and basically the the concept is that your reality is going through a filter and and everything that's happened externally, you're telling yourself a story about what that right. means and whether that's good or whether that's bad. And that that's real, your reality isn't what's happening. It's the story you're telling yourself and that you have complete control over that story. Right, that's and the classic narrative fallacy. That's, yeah, that's the narrative fallacy. And that's kind of the fundamental premise of, of Buddhism, which is your suffering is coming not from what's happening, but the story you're telling yourself. So I went on this long, you know, med- meditating and and reading and and kind of journaling about that, and that was that was a lot of fun. So so the we had this old joke about um, we had a softball team here in, over in Central Park, and we had the Buddhists playing the Stoics, and the game never finished. Everybody just sat down and started having, <laughs> having a long conversation. But uh, I'm right there with you. You mentioned your um, two of your mentors who were some of your earliest investors. Are there anybody else you want to mention as mentors? The professor uh, at Stanford you referred to also. Yeah, I'll, 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 both of those, uh, Tom, Tom Steyer, Doug Martin, and Irv Grosbeck were super important in, in my life. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Irv. He is probably probably if you had 
there's probably literally Barry a hundred people you could have on this con on this podcast that would list Irv as one of their most important really people. yeah wow he was he's a professor at at Stanford and just uh, you know makes time for folks he built an incredible business and he just has this you know uh, unwavering moral code um, he was an early investor he's the one who asked me to teach at Stanford and I just I just find the way he set up his life and his uh, it just just the way he he treats other people. Um, you're always the most important person in the world when you're with him, huh. and so I've 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 definitely learned learned a lot from him. Re- really interesting. Let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites, and what are you reading currently? Um, I it's funny. I end up rereading like the same ten books. Uh, in terms of my favorites, I read. I have some. I read currently too, but good to great. Uh, Warren Buffett's biography, Snowball, Steve Jobs' biography by Isaacson, Walt Disney's biography by Neil Gabler, uh, Switch by Dan and Chip Heath, Made to Stick, Dan and Chip Heath, Buffett's annual letters. Like those are like, I'm, I reread those. And, and every time I reread them, I get kind of re-energized. And we've modeled a lot of our business and a lot of my life over, around some of the things I learned in some of those books. And a lot of those are required reading at Alpine. I, I can imagine. What are you reading currently? And and right now I started getting on this uh, Brene Brown kick. Uh, mm-hmm. I, uh, I don't know if you've read some of her stuff, but the uh, the gifts of imperfection I'm reading right now, which is just phenomenal. She is. Uh, I, I actually downloaded it on Audible, so I get to hear her talk about it. But she has um, just this incredible way of talking about uh, about things that other people don't talk about, like shame and how to um, how to deal with the things you're not good at and how to be intellectually honest and and admit when you don't know things and she's uh, I, I love I love her work. What's the, the title of the book you're reading the, currently? The Gift of Imperfection. That sounds re- really yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um before I forget just as an aside and you could edit this out. So I went to law school with a guy named Lawrence Cunningham who was the first yeah. person who recognized Hey, all these letters from Warren Buffett, they're really fascinating, deep stuff. He bound them. Yeah, I bought that book. I own that book. That book has been a, like a perennial bestseller. Yeah. And it's, a you know, the old joke about the two economists walking down the street. One says, is that a $100 bill on the floor? And the other says, no, if it was a $100 bill, someone would have picked it up. <laughs> it, it's the same he thing with that. He picked it up, yeah. These, these have been around for literally yeah. – I mean, I think he first started in like 90 or 92, something like that. And Buffett had been around for 30 years by then already, or 25 years. Nobody had thought of doing this. And you know what? Like, it doesn't matter if it's crypto or software valuations or the internet. The stuff Buffett writes about is still the, the right stuff. It's, Fundamental, it's, common yeah, sense, you're block gonna, and tackling. You're going to discount the cash flows back and decide what you can pay. You're going to put a premium on the discount rate if the stuff is a lot more uncertain. It is this. It is exactly the right formula today, and it was 50 years ago, and it will be 50 years from now. And any time that there's something new where people says this time it's different, uh, you should be really skeptical. Oh, always. <laughs> All right, our final two questions. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college or business school graduate interested in a career in private equity? Well, I'll start with the first part, just general advice, um, and then I'll go to private equity. But, you know, as you can imagine, I actually give this advice all the time uh, teaching. But the the first thing that I think a lot of people graduating don't ask is like, what they what do I want? Mm-hmm. You know, what is five years from now, ten years from now? If I could, if if I knew I wasn't going to fail, what would I want to do with my life? And they and start with that question. And then start working backwards from that about what job you should take now and next year and five years from now. Instead, a lot of people just think, oh, these firms are interviewing on campus and I'll go here, I'll go here. And that's okay. But if you know where you want to be 10 years from now, it'll inform which firm you go to work and what skills you're trying to acquire. So I think I think that would be my advice is like in 10 years, you will you can do almost anything you set your mind to. And so give yourself permission to really answer that question. What do I want to do in 10 years? Why does it matter if you, quote, know you're, you wouldn't fail? Uh, is yeah. that just to open the set of possibilities? or Because, yeah, I always frame it as if you knew you wouldn't fail, what would you do? Because without that, people already jump to 
I can't do this. Like subconsciously in the mind. Fear of failure is that big. Fear of failure is so powerful. Even amongst really high performing, talented. I think it's even. I mean, Stanford (sighs) graduate students, I have to think that's the cream of the crop. In some ways, it's almost more prevalent because they have had so much success and they don't, you know, they have this incredible track record. But I would say the number one thing that Stanford Business School students, or, or really just about anyone in the world, it's the same thing, which is they, 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 their, their subconscious mind defaults to fear and fear of failure. That's fascinating because when I have discussions like this with colleagues or friends in Europe, the thing, or even Asia, the thing that makes the United States so unique in the developed economy world is that failure isn't a scarlet letter, especially in Silicon Valley. Right. It's almost a badge of honor. Look at all the VCs that list all, hey, we missed Apple and Cisco. We invested money in pets.com. Look how terrible we are, except for our 40% compounded returns. It's a badge of honor to say we tried this, face planted, brushed ourselves off, and moved on. But when you're starting out your career and you don't have anything to fall back on and you haven't yet had the success that you can look back, it's really scary for people. And the thing that they miss is they underestimate what they could really do in in 10 years and they underestimate themselves. Huh. They forgot what got them that seat at Stanford Business sure. School and they compare themselves to you know their, their roommate or their classmate or something. So the other half of the question, um, oh, for, in pri- advice uh, about private equity. Yeah, I would say I would say if if someone is interested in a career in private equity, I would I would say all private equity is not created equal, and there are, are thou, literally like probably a thousand different models, and figure out you know go talk to a bunch of companies that are doing uh, private equity in a whole bunch of different ways, and figure out what resonates with you and your interests and your superpowers, and where are you going to line up because it's it's a very diverse industry, and you know um, there are some firms that are making. Their money based on you know hardcore fundamental analysis. You know, our, we're making our money on talent. There's others that are, um, you know, doing cost cutting. There's a whole bunch of different ways, and one or more of those is going to line up a lot better with what you're excited about. And our final question: What do you know about the world of software services and private equity today that you wish you knew 28 years or so ago when you were first getting started? Well, two things. The first thing is. I wish I knew that it was going to work out fine, <laughs> you know. So I was so stressed and put so much pressure on myself that I wish I, if I could go back and tell myself anything, it would be like, "Hey, Graham, you know, it's going to be okay," because mm-hmm. uh, I went through a lot. That's uh, a really in- that's a really interesting answer because, you know, we just don't realize how much we freak ourselves out and and very often unnecessarily. What's the second thing? The second thing would be, I are, would be, I would, if I could have realized earlier on just how important the the world of talent is and how that was really the thing that drove uh, drove performance, because that that would have saved me a a decade. <laughs> so, uh, sounds really like um, you've honed in on exactly what makes your business work, and and really. Uh, quite fascinating. Graham, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Graham Weaver, founder and partner at Alpine Investors. 